And thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me. Good job in enduring the whole day of uh, dishonesty. Uh, I thought that the, the only thing that can be better or more impressive than to start with a quote from Nietzsche is to start with the Latin proverb, <laughs> which reads, Magna est veritas et bit, which means, as you all know, the truth is mighty and it uh, will prevail. And there's a, even a nice uh, off-take on this uh, proverb by Mark Twain, which is that the truth is mighty and it will prevail. There's nothing wrong with this except that it ain't so. <laughs> which I guess is more in line with, uh, with the day that we're having. Okay, I'll talk. Uh, the title is Dishonesty and the Presence of Others. Actually, Shachal touched on a lot of the, the things that I'll say in general. How others, in particular other beneficiaries, provide justification. So I'll go... It's structured as follows. I'll first go, go over a, a few ways in which others can be present, yeah, ways that affect um, dishonesty. And then I'll, I'll talk about a couple of my papers, uh, one completed, one in progress, that deal with these uh, different aspects of, uh, of this, of, of, of the presence of others. And um, I thought about the following. In some cases, there are others that are involved, but only indirectly affect or affected by dishonesty. And we had some examples before. I'll, I'll give some examples in a moment. And, and another obvious example is when other people are, or organizations are the beneficiaries of dishonesty. So I can lie or do something dishonest, immoral, but there is somebody else that gained from this. By the way, can we open the window a little bit? Yes. And another way that others can be present, which is uh, less touched on in the, the literature so far, Shachar mentioned briefly, is others as victims. Okay? And usually, it's a, in most of the experiments, it's kind of implied, not even implied, it's uh, implicit that the victim is the experimenter. It's not mentioned, it's just obvious. But the money has to come from somewhere, but it's not explicitly mentioned. But this can obviously make a difference. And, um, and, and what I worked uh, is on others as accomplices in, uh, in dishonesty. When you work with other people, not necessarily uh, as opposed to for other people or other organizations. And I guess I'll, that will be the biggest chunk of my, my talk, that uh, others as accomplices. Just a few examples of each. In, in, in this paper, for example, there was a study where, so this, these are examples of others that are indirectly involved, affect or affected by dishonest behavior. There's a dictator game when one person just decides how to allocate a sum of money between himself and another person, and a recipient. And in this case, the recipients were poorly, poorly treated. They received a low amount, and then they, were, uh, they could you know, toss a coin and earn more or less money according to the coin toss. And when, after being treated poorly, they are more, more likely to report a favorable outcome, to lie in favor of themselves. And, uh, Another issue is moral balancing. This is a, a bit similar where people can, um, um, there's the two, two dimensions in, in this paper. One is that there's a preceding experiment where they can uh, do better or worse. And then there's a, a coin toss, but it's a similar line. They, they don't, the, the other people don't, are not victims and they're not directly beneficiaries. Um, there's some work about upstream reciprocity, which is similar in line, but with the opposite twist, when after being treated favorably by another person in the dictator game, people are more likely to lie in favor of a third person. So again, that's a person that's indirectly related um, to, to lie or to the, to the initial uh, favorable or positive outcome. And the work with others as beneficiaries is, uh, is richer and it's more interesting. And there are a lot of different uh, like paradigms. So I'll just go, also go over a few of the different kind of, uh, of tasks that people have used to look at others as beneficiaries, but also that, that people used in general in this, in this literature. And some of them Shachar talked about before. Uh, in some papers, uh, in particular by Uwaginizi uh, and others, they use what, what's called sender-receiver games. And that's an example of three of those games. So look just only at treatment one for a moment. And the situation is that there are two like world states, call them A and B, two options. And there's a sender, player one, and a receiver, player two. Player one knows all of those numbers. What are the outcomes that are associated with each world state? But player two chooses which world state to implement or what will happen. And sender, player one can send a message to player two, telling him it's better if you choose option A, or it's better if you choose option B. 
And in this case, if you look at the, at the top row, option A means five points to myself if I'm the sender and six points to the receiver. And option two, uh, option B is the opposite, right? So it's in my interest that option B will be chosen. And it so happens that most of the time receivers follow the sender's advice here. So I can lie, I can tell the receiver it's better for you to choose option B, he will likely do so. And that's one uh, example of a, of a self-interested uh, dishonest behavior. But in some cases, the other person can benefit from this. And there's in this paper another one that, that focuses on white lies. Sometimes both of them can benefit. Um, so this is one paradigm that's been used um, to look at others as beneficiaries, also as victims. It will also appear in the, in the next slide. And one thing that also distinguishes these different paradigms is whether um, information is, is truly private or not. In this case, it is not. Me as the experimenter, if I run such an experiment, I know the truth, right? I know if um, the sender tells the truth or lies, as opposed to the, to the die tasks or to some or to the co uh, coin tosses that are done in private. That's a major distinction between these diff different games that are used, or different tasks that are used. Another type of game, uh, a really nice one, uh, that was used by uh, Scott Rotema, is uh, unscrabbling word, word jumbles. And the way it works, you have these nine uh, jumbles, and you have to make a word out of each of letters, out of each one. And you get paid accordingly. If you do one, you get paid one dollar. You get two, you get paid two dollars, I think, or two or something. If you do three, you get paid three. But the interesting thing is that to be paid four or more, you have to get the three first ones correct. Can you do it? Unscramble the first one. Can you see it? Can you see it? Hunted, yeah. Okay. Okay, the first one is hunted. It's quite easy. The second one, can you do it? I don't remember myself. House. House. House, right? Can you do the third one? I remember, you have to get the three first ones right in order to be eligible to receive the payment for the four, five, six, seven, and eight. No. <laughs> so the third one is quite tough. It's not impossible, but uh, the vast majority of people don't get it. I did not know that there's a word that's Taguan. And if you learn one thing today, let's at least learn what's Taguan. <laughs> it means three things. That's a Taguan. Okay, it's so kind of a flying squirrel. By the way, it flies not, not to hunt, but just an efficient way to move around. They've been seen uh, to fly up to 90 meters between trees. Is, is it, are they really flying or are they kind of falling like no. these? Squirrels? They're gliding. Yeah, okay. And they direct themselves with this relatively big tail so they can even kind of move around. Awesome. I didn't see a movie when I read with the Wikipedia, of course, about <laughs> the flying squirrel. There's also a mountain in Taiwan and a hide and seek game in the Philippines that go by the name of Taguan. <laughs> a hide and seek game in the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but the point here is that if people, the measurement of blank here is people, this is self-reported. People do this and self-report how many they get, what, what's their earnings. If you say that you answered the third one correctly, you're lying because nobody knows the third one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the measurement. If you say Taguan, you, you, you think that you're lying because nobody knows the one, right? So if we get it right, you're lying. Yeah, okay, so for a small percentage, you have like uh, this uh, yeah, yeah. false positives here, but okay, <laughs> it doesn't really affect the data. So it's a, a neat measurement of line. It's a little bit like the mattresses that, Ch that Chahal talked about. You have to self-report, and that's the idea, because uh, you just uh, shed, shred them, or just ask for, the, for your money. But if you ask for more than two, it implies that you got the third one correct, and then with, um, it's very likely that you're lying. The last one, by the way, is also an, uh, kind of an impossible word, and it's a control, because it's not critical for anything else. The third one is really critical, because the rules are such that you have to get the third one right in order to get uh, to be eligible for the, for the rest. It means, I don't remember what it means, come look at it. Another one that we talked about is simply rolling, uh, rolling dice in a cup or in private and uh, peeking through a hole, which makes it obvious that nobody can see. That's what I will use in, uh, in the experiments that I do. There are the mattresses that Chow talked about. There's the dot tasks that uh, a guy talked about. And there are other, other tasks that have been used um, when looking at others as beneficiaries. There's much less work uh, considering others as victims of uh, dishonest behavior. And one nice, work, one nice uh, paper 
that a little bit precedes this uh, relatively recent wave of uh, behavioral uh, ethics is a field experiment done in a call center. So the people, their job was uh, to answer the phone and uh, provide customer service. And they were asked to stay after hours for an another hour and uh, fill out surveys, long questionnaires that take about an hour to, to complete. And the point was that they were underpaid for this. They were only paid $2 for this. So they feel, feel mistreated. And they could essentially pay themselves by taking pennies out of a bowl of pennies. In one condition, the bowl, it was applied that the bowl belongs to the company. And in another condition, it was uh, implied that, uh, that, that the money in the bowl belongs to the particular manager that was arranging the whole thing. And it depended on some more factors, but when, when it came out of the pocket of another manager, and a particular person, nobody cheated. Everybody took exactly what they, or roughly what, what they were supposed to do. But when it was the company's money, uh, people took more than they were supposed to take. Okay. And this, by the way, is a compare. So usually, if you think about an experiment, that the money comes off of the, of the lab, the university, the research institute. It's a little bit like a company, right? There's no particular person attached to that, so that's more similar to the usual experimental practice, where it's uh, a company that's incurring the losses. The same sender-receiver games, they, they use the other is also a victim. And then they, they see that people are sensitive to, the, to how much another person uh, suffers from, the, from lying. When, people, when the other one suffers more, people lie less. Not that they don't lie, but they lie less. And uh, there are a couple of experiments, one by myself and, uh, and, and Matteo Plan and Elio Sorofella that I'll talk about more later. And another by Fischbacher and Paul Mihoisi. Don't look explicitly at the distinction between the regular experimental practice, when it's uh, the lab incurs a loss, and uh, a case where it's a particular individual. In, in, th in these cases, another participant in the, in the experiment that has to pay for the dishonest behavior. Um, obviously, the like, prediction is that people will lie more when it's uh, the lab, or when it's not specified, than with another person. In this first experiment, they, it was inconclusive, possibly due to lack of power, and I'll tell you later what we found in, uh, in our experiment about this. Now, what I'll talk about for the majority of the time today is cases where others are accomplices. There's not much work on this, uh, I think, only by myself, but is there, at least uh, when you think about accomplices in the, in the sense that I'll, uh, uh, that I'll use it. Okay, so this is, the paper is called The Collaborative Roots of Corruption by myself and Shao Shalvi. And uh, the starting point for this, and this is a bit relevant also for generally the cases where others are beneficiaries. By the way, feel free to ask questions uh, whenever, and in particular it's relevant to the, uh, one of the papers by, by Shacha where you either lied for yourself or for a group of two or within a group of three. You also could have justified, why is it interesting in the first place? It's because we are, as humans, a uh, rather cooperative. We cooperate in large groups um, uh, that transcend the bounds of, uh, of genetic uh, kinship. And this has been explained, or there are many explanations and a lot of work about why, why it's so. But one claims that we have a, like an ingrained moral sentiment uh, to cooperate. And it implies that cooperation is just a good thing in itself. It's like a, it's a value in itself. So just by cooperating, you're already moral. And uh, never mind about the mechanism for that. And uh, it's obviously good cooperation, but we saw already today that it can also be bad, right? Because it leads us, for example, in some of the of Shachar's examples, to, to lie more. And I'll, I'll also talk about a case where it leads us to lie a lot more. Well, in particular, I'll say that, that this willingness to, that, that we have, okay, will demonstrate that there's a willingness to, to forfeit moral standards in order to establish mutually beneficial collaborative relations with each other. And to a degree, the kind of um, collaborative relations that I'll um, focus on, you can think of it in two ways. One is that they lead us to not care anymore about self-concept maintenance, or that they lead us to maintain our self-concept, but with, still with lying a lot, uh, arguably uh, qualitatively more than in a, a lot of the literature. And like, in the background is a paper from something to think about by Kohn, Pehr, and Merachal, I think, Merachal, about dishonesty in the banking industry. The experiment is very roughly as uh, they show that, that bankers and people that identify as bankers while they're doing the experiments, 
line work. They, it's a coin toss. It's funny, but they uh, toss the coin 20 times and they count how many times they like. And um, so the bankers lie more than uh, normal people. And they attribute this to, to the, some of the big, relatively recent uh, financial scandals. We try to argue that, that this, these kind of scandals can also be a result of a can be a result of a cooperative corporate culture in those organizations. So they can be a result of something that is essentially a good thing, or easy to agree that it's a good thing. Uh, for example, the blue code of silence is uh, the practice by which police officers will not mis uh, report each other's misconduct. Okay, that's clearly a very collaborative uh, thing to do, but it's also clearly not uh, uh, not ethical, not an ethical thing to do, and it can be detrimental to the organization, to society, and so on. Another example. Mm. I'll give another example, just. That, uh, that, that captures some of the characteristics of the, of the task that I'll tell you about in a moment is has to do with the, with the setup for the financial crisis. And one of the things that, that led to the crisis is the relationship, or the perverse relationship between investment banks and credit agencies. Again, very really crudely, investment banks came up with uh, financial products, derivatives that are structured in a very complicated way, so hard to evaluate how risky they actually were, and they market them as if they are relatively non, uh, not, not so risky. The credit agencies are supposed to rate these products. And the best thing is a triple A rating, which means that they are uh, not risky and uh, it's kind of a recommendation for buying. But over time, there, um, these two uh, players became dependent in the sense that if I'm a bank, I issue the product and Panos is the, the agency that's supposed to rate the product, I choose if, he, if I want him to rate my product and I pay him for doing this job. Okay, so if he doesn't provide a good rating, I will just go to somebody else. Okay, so note that the banks, at the end, this thing blew up and uh, it turned out that these products were relatively risky and they defaulted and uh, this in a large part led to the crisis. So I issue a product that's relatively risky. Probably I know that, but I market it as if it's not risky. And Panos has all the incentive to match my evaluation. Because if he does so, he'll get more business from me. And he's an expert, so he probably knows that it's quite risky as well, but still very few of these agencies uh, were like, firm enough to, to evaluate these uh, products as they were. And you'll see later how this corresponds to the, to the game or task that we, that we play, uh, that we look at. Okay, I'll skip some of these things. Well, the key concept here is corrupt collaboration. We define it as the attainment of profits by joint immoral acts, things that you do together. And I just want to, just to clarify that I, I use the word collaboration as distinct from cooperation, like as a subcase or a more special case. And to clarify, I'll say that if I give Panos example, uh, advice about his paper and he gives me advice and feedback about my paper, I will call that cooperation. But if we're working on the same paper, I would say that we're collaborating. We're creating... Uh, one thing, one object, there's one object to our uh, mutual relationship. So what's the difference again? That, that collaboration has a specific aim? Or? That we're really doing it together. It's joint work, it's not like mutual help, which is also cooperation. Uh -huh. okay. Cooperation is a more general term. Right. And uh, okay, this I can skip, we talked about it a lot before. And roughly the picture was that people care a lot about mm, self-concept maintenance in all of the settings that we talked about, including the cooperative ones. And uh, we'll look at collaboration. So right down to exactly what we did. Uh, we used the dying cup paradigm. We had it, everything was done in the tradition of experimental economics. We had a, a large lab with uh, 32 cubicles, with dividers. We had up to 32 people at a time in the lab. And they were, each one had a cup. And in the cup there was a regular six-sided die, which they could roll and pick through a hole and report the result. They were paired, so it's about dyads collaborating, and there's always a player A and a player B. And it works as follows. First, player A um, rolls the die, and then he reports the result on, on his computer. And player B sees the report, and then does the same. Also rolls and reports. It's sequential, so first the one and then the other. And they're paid as follows. If the reported outcomes are equal, then emphasis on the reported outcomes, because the actual outcomes are unknown to us. If the reported outcomes are equal, each player receives that amount in euros. Okay, and if they're different, they receive nothing. For example, if both of them report five, each earns five. 
likewise for four, six, and so on. If one reports six and the other reports four, each earns zero because uh, it's not uh, the same number. We'll call it a double when both are the same. Now what happened? Now we had pe people, as I said, they were paired and they engaged in this task for 20 repetitions with the same person. Okay, the, the only communication, they didn't know who the other person was because there were uh, up to 32 people in the lab at a time, but it was the same person all the time and they knew this. This treatment is called aligned outcomes because the outcomes are aligned. They both are the same. This will not be the case in other treatments. But let's first look at the results in this treatment. Um, okay, first you'll see a, a simulation, a hypothetical result, assuming that people are honest, just to get an impression of what, uh, what to look for. And this is player A's reports, and this is player B's reports. He has six options, and he has six options. And the, if everybody is both are honest, the 400 dots, because 20 repetitions, and uh, 20 diets are distributed rel relatively uniformly with some noise. And when there's a double wide of six, these are the profitable cells, right? The ones on the diagonal, when both report the same. And if they lie, we expect them to lie. Uh, we expect more observations on the diagonal, and in particular on the high values of the diagonal. Right? That's where the highest profits are. And that's indeed what we find. So they lie a lot in this case, in this game. And rather than lying, getting a double one out of six uh, uh, cases, they do so more than 80% uh, of the time. Okay, so, so first the feeling is that there's a, uh, some people at least are really lying a lot and consistently all the time, otherwise you can't uh, sustain such high uh, success rates in, the, in this test. Now let's look a little bit how this works uh, like at the, at the diet level. So these are, I'll show you now a few prototypical uh, dia is actual data from the experiment. Uh, when there will be a circle, it's A's report, the first one, and then X is the B, B's report. Okay, so that means that A reported 6 on the first period. Okay, it's possible. The probability is 1 out of 6, and this will happen. So even under honesty, this could happen. And this means that player B matched A's report. So this was a profitable uh, period for them. Uh, but it's still relatively probable. 1 out of 36, uh, uh, that's a probability of this happening. But now the probability goes down to 1 over 216, and now it goes down to 1 over 1,296. And this, this cannot happen, <laughs> but it happens a lot in the experiment. So obviously the probability is uh, practically zero. And we'll call this a case, a, a case where A sets the stage and B gets the job done. But also all of the other combinations that you can think of occur. Later I'll try to tell you, I'll tell you how much each, one's occur, each one occurs. But it also happens that A sets the stage by reporting sixes, right? That's what A can do, right, if he wants to lie. But B does not get the job done. So he does on the first round, but he, not on the second, and also not later. So this is a relatively infrequent case where A is lying all the time and B is not lying at all, or probably not lying at all. Still, note that A, uh, even if B is honest, A inflates his profit this way. Because with, if, without lying, he can expect to earn um, 58 euro cents per trial, right? 3.5 times 1 over 6 if there's a double. And now he guarantees himself a high payoff if there's a double. Also, the opposite happens that A does not set the stage. A appears to be reporting truthfully, but B gets the job done every time. We don't really know what to expect. And the probabilities are all, always equally low, right? It's, it's virtually impossible to, to match 20 times in a row or to report a 6 uh, 20 times in a row. And uh, another particularly nice thing that happens is uh, in this particular diet, there's very clear evidence of, of communication. And also the behavior was a bit strange and funny. So they start with five rows of mutual fours, and obviously it's the A player that's deciding that it will be four, right? because he's, and B is just matching A. This can be a bit frustrating for B, because B is obviously mm -hmm. willing to lie. So in the next round, A reports four again, but B reports six. <laughs> and the message is clear. <laughs> if we're going to lie, why not make a, <laughs> a maximum? And, and A is a little bit thick, so he... <laughs> okay, you can think of, it, of this as some kind of self-concept maintenance on A's part. Right? Okay, we'll lie, we'll lie, but we won't lie all the way. We'll do six of this, we'll four, maybe five. Uh, but B, B is not concerned with, uh, with this. He doesn't just want to as much as possible. And it was profitable. He lost a few, some money on that round, but it, over the whole, uh, the whole course of the game, it was profitable. 
Now, this is all the data. There were 20 diets. So we have 20 examples of such behavior. So that's the one that I just talked to, told you about. And that's, uh, we have a few of those. And actually, we have five cases where the first always sets the stage, and the second always gets the job done. <laughs> we have four cases where A, where the first player, I call it mostly sets the stage. OK, reports kind of mixes between fives and sixes here, here, and here, here's an occasional four. But uh, clearly reports only very high values, and B always gets the job done, 20 out of 20 times. Um, and the last one, the, the blue circle, is, is the only case where A is honest, or seems to be honest, and B still always gets the job done. That's not a, a common thing. Also in the other treatments that I'll tell you about later. Altogether, we have focusing on the B players, because they are the crucial ones in the setting. Half of them are what we call totally brazen. Brazen is bold and shameless. You can read it as not particularly concerned with self-concept maintenance or able to maintain their self-concept just with the cooperative relations and not uh, by uh, not lying. But also you can see more, more cheater among B. Yeah. But the cheating is defined a bit differently between A and B. But yeah, yeah, but still, like the magnitude of cheating, the brazen cheating, Yeah. I'll count it. In a few slides, I'll, I'll explicitly count how many brazen A's and brazen B's we have in the uh, we'll see. Actually, I'm not sure if there are more A's or B's that are brazen. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Probably to B. Okay, but here... Because A is always 6. It's only 6, but B is there are more. All right, B, there are 10. Right. If you, if you define brazen by the most extreme behavior, which for A's would be consistent 6's, and for B would be consistently matching That's A's report. So now a bit about what we compare this to. This is, I think, a nice in itself, because they're, they're really lying a lot, and it seems qualitatively more than in some of the other um, um, that, uh, works in, the, in this literature. But one thing we compare this to is to an individual setting, which is very similar, except that there's only one person, and he reports roles twice. We call him player X. Player X rolls a die and reports the outcome, and then he does it again. And the, the payoff is the same. If he reports the same number twice, he just earns that amount. So two fives, the guy will earn five. Six and a four, he will earn zero. That's the individual's treatment. And it so happens that people lie more in the one before, in the collaborative settings. There were 82% of doubles before, and now only 55. I say only 55, because it's less than 82, but it's still a lot, 55. Obviously much more than uh, round 17 that you expect. And if you count the brazen players, the B players, in the individual case it doesn't matter, there is no A and B players. Brazen players, people who report 20 doubles, there are much more in the aligned outcomes in the collaborative setting than in the individual setting. So people, the collaborative uh, settings seems to bring the worst out of the out of these people, particularly the B players. Now there are a, bu uh, a bunch of additional, you can think of them as control condition, in which we break the alignment. So now they won't earn the same, the two players. And we'll do it in the following ways. In one case, if there's a double, player B always receives six, regardless of the value of the double. And so now B doesn't care if it's a double one, two, or three, or so on. He just wants a double, and he earns a high amount. And A is still, still earns as before. Right? So even if it's a double five, B earns six, and A earns five, because it's a double five. And in a very similar treatment, and that one is called B high, just because B earns a high amount. And in another treatment, B low, you can guess B receives only one euro, regardless of the value of the double. So even if it's a double five, B earns one, and A earns five. If there's no double, none of them earns anything. So in these two conditions, B still has an interest in a double, but it doesn't care about the value of the double. And there's another treatment, which we call B fixed, in which B earns the one euro, regardless of the reports. It just earns one euro. It doesn't matter what they report. Even one year if there's a double, but also one year if there is no double. And this can be a case of one of the first examples of the, like this kind of a classification that I did at the beginning, a case where there's another player, but he's not the beneficiary or the victim of the slang behavior, behavior. And that's the B player here. Right, so, and because he doesn't care. He's involved in the situation, obviously, and we'll even measure his line. But uh, obviously also A can lie here. And, uh, 
B is not affected. So we have those three treatments, B high, B low, and B fixed, and you can guess that we also have three similar treatments for the A players, which are the same, A high, A low, and A fixed, or A or in six, or one, or a constant one. Now, the main DV here is the number of uh, reported doubles, and that's obviously, obviously depends on the B player, right? because B is the one who decides on the double. So you would expect that you find a bit stronger effect of these manipulations Sorry, a stronger effect on, the, on this particular DV when you manipulate B's, uh, B's incentive than you when you manipulate A's incentive. Is it clear the logic? Because right? B is the one deciding here. We're measuring something that has to do with, with B. But somewhat surprisingly, it's the same. If you compare A high and B high, it's the same number of doubles, same for A low and B low. And also with A fixed and B fixed, it's not a significant difference at all between the number of doubles. So altogether, we can say that the A treatments have the same effect as the B treatments. And we interpret that as, a, as indicating that the B players are sensitive to the incentives of the A players. Because they react to changes in those in the same way as they react to changes in their own incentives. Another thing that you see here is those circles, which, which are a count of the brazen B players, not the A players. The A players will count maybe in, a, in, a, in the next slide. And the result of that, they're much more brazen B players in the aligned outcome setting. So before I told you that the collaborative setting brings out the worst relative to an individual setting, in this sense, when you look, focus on the brazen behavior, it brings out the worst relative to the not aligned settings. So the worst is when people act in collaboration and their incentives are aligned. Okay, another thing that we this is a bit following that uh, funny diet that I, that I showed you before that started with four. We tried to look at that, all kinds of communication or signaling that can go on in the process of these 20 periods. And uh, there are many things to look at, but I'll, look, uh, I'll tell you about the following. So I just showed you that these are, incent are sensitive to the incentives of the A players. But I'll, I'll show you now that they are also sensitive to the behavior of the A players. And I'll do that by classifying both the B's and the A's as either brazen or not brazen. And I'll, as I said before, a brazen A is one who consistently reports sixes, and a brazen B is one who consistently matches A's report. So it's a different definition, but the concept is just the most extreme dishonest behavior that you can uh, do, do here. And we'll compare the proportion of brazen B's when A is brazen to the proportion of brazen B's when A is not brazen. And in the aligned outcome setting, in every case where A is brazen, B is brazen as well. We saw those cases before. It's five out of five. It was the five cases where they had consistent sixes. There was not even one case where A reported consistent sixes and, uh, and, and B did not match. And it's the same pattern for all of the other dyadic, uh, dyadic treatments. But we have B is much more likely to be brazen when A, when A is brazen as well. But the levels are much lower. So another demonstration that there's much more brazen uh, behavior in, uh, when the incentives are aligned. Okay, just some conclusions from this. Uh, so the term that we use is corrupt collaboration. So this the kind of collaborative setting, and it's not uh, it's completely in line with uh, the results that Shachar talked about uh, before with, uh, with with the group setting settings. Uh, collaboration of this kind of seems to provide a particularly strong justification for line. And I, initially, I thought about it as reducing concern for self-concept maintenance, but I think it makes more sense to think in terms that it's, a, it's another way to, to maintain your self-concept. Okay, but um, you get the gist. It's more likely than individual corruption, and it's uh, most likely when incentives are aligned relative to when they are not aligned. And in a, in a relatively practical manner, collaboration, it's a good thing in an organization and in many settings, but it should also, it should also be monitored. Uh, because it's dangerous. It can be like a slippery slope for this kind of dishonest behavior. I want to make a small methodological pause um, just to talk about something that I like that's relevant to these kind of experiments, but actually to many uh, experimentation in general. And to mention that in this case, we use what I call a within session design. That all of these eight treatments that we have were run in the same session. And uh, I think it's really important because to claim that the experimental treatments are, are what's driving the differences, and that's what we want to claim when we have different treatments, 
first we need random assignment to treatments, and we also need lack of confounds or other factors that affect in a, the results in a systematic way. But if you suppose that I did each of these treatments in a separate session, then some of them would be in the morning, and some would be in the evening, and some would be in the winter, and some would be in the summer. And sometimes experiments take a long time to run. And obviously each of these can affect the results. People can be tired, or people can be hungry, and uh, tiredness or hunger can systematically affect their inclination to, to be dishonest, the weather, and so on. Also, there could be natural shocks. Maybe that morning there was a, some big scandal reported in the media. It can affect all of the results on that day or that week in a systematic way. And if you have one particular treatment on a given day, it's obviously hard to interpret the result because we don't know what's driving them. And if you run all of the treatments in the same day, every time, then you avoid all of these problems. Okay, so that's the solution. The problem is that, at least in, uh, in experimental economics, it's a little bit less of an issue in psychology, because in psychology, sometimes you tend to run um, participants one by one. So it's easy to mix within the same hour or the same day. But here, if you in experimental economics, you usually run 20 or 30 people at a time. And it's important, it's the common practice is to read instructions out aloud, to make sure that everybody is aware that you're all having the same, receiving the same instructions, so that there's common knowledge about, about the game, about the setting. And, um, one partial solution to this is to have the general instructions read out aloud, so everybody knows them, but mention in the instructions that there will be particular parameters that will be displayed on screen, for example, or an individualized uh, uh, instruction. In this case, they had tables on their screens, and we told them that they will have them, which, which uh, lay out the, the payoffs. Something like, this, this says here, uh, first report, second report, um, your income and partner's income. And you see all the numbers. But this is how they received information about the particular set of numbers that were, was relevant to them. And it's different, different uh, for different people in the same, uh, in the same session. Okay, I'll skip something, some follow-up project on this, so I can talk about the victim identity a bit. So not keep you too long. Okay. Now with another project, so that's, a, that's all about uh, the corrupt collaboration, or about the cases where the other is a, an accomplice. Any questions about that? Okay. Yeah? yeah. Have, you, have you done uh, experiments where you switch, where you let players switch? Like, the first round, player A is the one that rolls the dice with first, and then in the second round, player B is the No, we didn't. So here it was constant. It was the same person A throughout, and uh, same for B. No like, deep philosophical reason for that. You just have to choose one thing and we get a piece of it. This might be kind of a silly question, but in a game like that, especially I can imagine it being actually quite funny, you know, that you're looking and then you're recording something, and there becomes a sort of something fun that's happening between two people. Does that give you any concern about the external validity of the elements for that? Some, but it's also a good thing in a sense. Because mm -hmm. I think one of the powers of these collaborative relations are that they're fun. I just mean like in a setting, if we were playing this game, it might be really funny and we might laugh and do this, but not necessarily do that in the real world. It's true. And so you think for the stock market it's going to be even more fun? No, I believe in the stock market. <laughs> that's a whole different thing. Yeah, that, that's them, but that's a certain thing that hurts them too. I'm just curious. Oh, so first, understand the comment uh, exactly. It could be fun and it could be driving some of the results. So one of the reasons that people, maybe, one of the reasons that people lie so much here is because it's fun. Okay? But I'm showing, hopefully, that it's more fun in some situations than in others. And this feeling of fun, you can also just think of it as the, this warm glow from, from collaborating with somebody else, of helping and be helping and building something together. All of these good feelings uh, arise to a different level in the different settings. This is one of the things that drives the result. That's fine. Because also in the real world, it feels good to so collaborate with my, with my colleagues, even if we're doing unethical uh, things. Yeah, they know it's somebody in the room, but you don't know who it is. And they can't really you know, unless they do very serious. Uh, they also leave one by one, so practically they don't know who's the, who's the person. But it's in, someone in the room that they know. 
Okay, so the second project that I'll tell you about, it will be shorter, is uh, about victim identity. It's called Max of Fritz. It's a partly joke because we did it in, uh, in the Max Planck Institute in Vienna. And the comparison is between two cases. One where the victim is the, the lab, that's Max. And one where it's another person in the lab, another participant, and that's Fritz. It's the prototypical German. Uh, so it was chosen because it's prototypical and it's because it sounds good together with Max. I know it's not the only prototypical treatment. But the question is, who's, how does the victim of the the victim of lying affect the, the tendency to, to lie? There's some inconclusive evidence from 2013. I told you before about the field study that suggests that that shows that people lie more when they're taking money away from the company relative to money from uh, an individual uh, manager in the company. And um, what we did here is a two by two design. One factor was the victim identity, and uh, could be another person or their experimenter. And another, which is not the focus here, but uh, it's what we did, is whether this is all done in a loss or a gain frame. Okay, and we thought about kind of different situations in, in real life where we can cheat. One, for example, is uh, cheating on my tax reports, and I would say that that's a loss frame. Okay, because I already have the money, and now the report determines how much I have to give back. Okay, but fraudulent uh, insurance claims are in the gain frame because I don't have the money, I can report something and then I will get some money from the insurance. Maybe. But clearly some situations are like this and some are like others. And, um, okay, so those are the two factors. And we also looked at, uh, okay, with, with respect to the other, the loss versus gain, the, the prediction is clear. If you think uh, in prospect theory and this losses loom larger than gains, you expect people to, to lie more in, a, in the loss frame, where they already own something than they would to lie when they need to gain the same thing. And there's some results that, uh, not, not many, but a few results that support this prediction. Okay. I forgot to say before, uh, okay, the social value rotation, which I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, plays a major role in this, as you will see. And what is it, social value orientation? It's, uh, it's, are people familiar with this measure? It's a measure of, of the way people like, divide their attention or, or care about their own outcome relative to the outcome or profit of another person, not this is an unspecified person. It works like this. You have to make choices, many, a few of these kind of choices, six or in one version of it, a location between yourself and another person. You have to choose one of these pairs. Here, for example, you get 50 and the other gets 100. You get 54, the other 89 and so on. The, most ext the other extreme is you get 85 and the other gets 15. And these kind of vary systematically. Uh, the allocation to yourself from 50 to 85 and to the other from 100 to 15 and you have to choose one of these. That's the best for you. And you do a few of these and in this version of it they are arranged in a circle and uh, this is the payoff to yourself and this is to another and each one of those choices corresponds to one of these lines. Okay, and you kind of position yourself on each of the lines and uh, then the, something like the geometrical mean is computed, and then there's an angle. So I answer this, and I have a point that summarizes all of my choices. And there's an angle that's associated with that point. That angle uh, is a measure of how much, where I position my interest between my pay off to self and pay off to other. I can care only about myself, that would be zero. I can care only about others, that would be altruistic, or it could be somewhere in between. Okay, so the measure, you can also classify people, and that's what I'll do to altruistic, which basically don't exist, pro-socials, which is about half of the people, individualistic people, which is almost all of the other half, and competitive people. Competitive people care more about outscoring the other person, even in a, willing to incur a loss just to do better. Okay. Yeah, theoretically there are four types. Practically there are two, because there are virtually no altruists, there are very few competitive people, that's just a distribution. That you typically find. So the, the comparison is between pro self and uh, individualistic and uh, pro self. Relative, it's like maximum difference. Yeah. yeah. In favor of yourself. Yeah. Is there actually um, a difference in type between pro self? I don't remember it from the top of my mind, but I'm pretty sure that, that this has been checked. It okay. has been shown, yeah. yeah. Uh, paper by Randall Novak, I think, that, but I think that it has been shown on uh, cooperation. That, and uh, there is a gender difference. Uh, 
So females what? need a Interaction job. between the gender and the time? And the yes. Time. So women become, become more pro-social when you don't give them time, guys need a little bit more time, I think so. So if you give us time, we become more social. Yeah, yeah, we become more social. We become like women. Give us time. <laughs> Actually, but we have a paper that shows that if you give them more time, they are more... Um, they, they, they take more... But it depends, because I think that they just uh, uh, say that this is true for what you say is true for women. No, for guys, but they, uh, they, they didn't be male. check the gender, but this is what you find overall. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, not knowing this uh, literature, so is it, is it uh, the social orientation, is it uh, robust to changing a little bit, uh, the, let's say, the values? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's a nice measure. To, uh, often, uh, you can see that arranges data nicely, you know, in different uh, like social settings. Also on this one. <coughs> this is what the, the, the screen that they saw actually looked like. So this is from the middle of it. And you see there it says roll the die and import the result. This is roll five out of ten. If the result is four, five, or six, so effectively it's a coin toss, but they actually use the die, but it's just two options. If the result is four, five, or six, you gain fifty cents, and then you have to input here the number. Click OK, and then 50 cents will move, like one block will move from here to here. So in the, this is number five, and the first four, they twice uh, reported the, the good outcomes. So this started, this was the, the gain, like the, the gain treatment, right? because all of the money was initially in the other account of it. In this case, another participant. This was explained in the instructions. So we started with 10 blocks here and zero over there, and then they can move blocks to themselves. And in the other condition, conditions. And the loss gain, everything was here at the beginning. And sometimes, depending on the result, uh, the blocks would move there. And it wouldn't be another participant, but it would just be, I think, unspecified. We just, we wouldn't make a big deal of where this money is coming from. The other account just belongs, goes back to the experiment. Nobody gets it. Um, so they did this for 10 times. That, that was the experiment. And these are the results. I'll just walk you through this. So first it's divided between individualistic people, and af after that task, they did the, the social value rotation, the, the measure that I talked about before. So this is divided to the individualistic people and the pro-social people. And it's divided also to loss and gain. Fritz, I remind you, is uh, another person, and Max is the, the laboratory, uh, the victim. And this is the mean number of winning rolls. Five means no lying at all, okay? Because that's what you expect, it was 10 rolls. So five is uh, the expectation of zero or zero, zero lying. Also here, the individualistic, so result number one, clear, that's just a short version of that, as the individualistic people lie more than the pro-social one. It's not very surprising. Just being pro-social in itself is kind of a, of a moral attribute, so they're just generally more uh, morally firm, the pro-socials. So they also lie less, regardless of the other conditions. But they also re uh, react differently to the manipulations. Now, the individualistics, it seems that there's a pattern there, but there's nothing is significant there. So it's kind of all the same, the level of line. Not sensitive to the, to the frame, loss or gain, and not sensitive to the victim. The individualistic, they just care about themselves. And they decide how much to let. So now, the pro-social is a bit more tricky. You see the effect, of victim, the effect of victim identity only in the gain frame. Okay, compare these two. Okay, then you see the effect that you, you expect. Less line when it's another person than when it's a... Uh, the laboratory. Okay, it's a bit tricky because it's all an interaction here. And similarly, you see the effect of the frame only when it's a uh, when it's a uh, the experimenter or the laboratory is uh, incurring the cost. Okay. Oh, sorry, that was a mistake. Sorry. That should be Fritz and the opposite. Okay? So the effect of the frame of the loss versus gain is only when it's another person involved in the situation. So everything here is in the direction that we thought. More lying in the in the loss frame, and more lying when it's uh, in max. But it's uh, they interact with each other. So to actually get more lying, we need both of them together at the same time. And I think that's about it. Uh, 
So I showed you some examples of others in these kind of experiments as the beneficiaries, as victims, as accomplices. Um, one thing just that arranges these, is, uh, in my mind, these, these kind of experiments are, are whether the information is private or not. So who knows the truth? In some cases, uh, the experimenter knows the truth, in some cases not. Uh, in, in these experiments, we did not know. Uh, so within some methodological comments, and uh, that's it. And questions, welcome. Thank you. Explanation: Why do you think in the gain domain they were more sensitive to the victimized effect than in the loss domain? Because in the, in the loss domain they should have more attention. Yes. No. More attention. According to loss attention. Well, you can think about it this way: In order for people, for the pro-social people, to lie less. And they would, under some baseline, which is about here, for them to lie less, it has to be first another person and in a, like in a game domain. So when it's a lost domain, you don't care who the other person is. It's a between okay. or within social? Within lost. Between. So how many pro social people did you have overall? It's about half of the sample. The sample was about 250 decision makers. Some people were passive players in the... Because basically you have like eight conditions, only in one condition you find something that is not really yeah. clear why. No, but we have, uh, so it's about 30 people in each of these... Yeah. No, they, have the, they have the main effect of the guy. Well, the individual is the yeah, that, okay, that's clear. That's that, not the focus of this, uh, yeah. of this paper, but yeah. Okay. So the way I... As I told you, the way I, the way I read this is that for all of so first we expected we can think of it as less lying when you, when you have to take it from somebody else or in a game frame. You also expected less lying when it's another person, but both have to happen at the same time. At least with these people, even the pro-social people, to actually have the effect. So that that's a, that summarizes the result. I think it makes sense. So that, we expected each one separately, but the result is that uh, one we need both. So when I I'm about to lose money, I have no friends. No. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, so in a way this, uh, uh, you would probably get the same result if, if the participants had uh, played the, the stack on game, right? So, so you just need them, they actually play the coordination game, right? Who? The, the participants. Have Here. You, yeah, to, to go for the dog. No, this is a different experiment, different rules. Ah, okay. not, uh, here they just roll the die and, and either earned or lost. It's not about that. There's nothing collaborative here. It's just a manipulation of the identity of the victim and the uh, loss in the game frame. Sorry if it wasn't clear enough. Yeah? Mm, I'm very interested in this moral alignment kind of thing that you talked about. Is there a like, I wouldn't call it moral alignment, but more of an incentive alignment. Yeah. Just yeah. Or, okay, wait, but then, then I have a question. <laughs> um, not, or a different question. Um, do you think, like, because you, you make the distinction between the one who sets the stage and the other who, who uh, kind of uh, gets the job done, um, do you think that there is some influence from, from from player A to player B, right? So if you, yeah. if I showed you, you some data that yeah. suggests this, that, there, that there is some influence yeah. in that direction. Yeah. So in that sense, I, I would say that that is sort of an alignment. Like for player B, aligns to player A in, in the sense that they can see, okay, the player, my, my, my partner is honest or he's not honest, and so it's easier for me to sort of yeah. also be not sure. honest. So that, that's completely the, the way we explain it, but in particular, when, when it's aligned, it's much easier to get this kind of message across. Yeah. Yeah. So the player B, uh, it's much easier for B to justify his lying on, on A's behavior when the payoffs are aligned. Yeah. And um, it don't, it's, just, it's nice that it doesn't matter in which way you break the alignment. If you increase mine or decrease mine, I st it still has the same effect. So it just, it's worth it that they're the same. Um, are there 
do you know any other studies that sort of investigate the, the this phenomenon of like multiple or uh, collaborate decision making moral? In this sense, no. We have one follow up that I skipped just because uh, I can tell you about it later. A sequential setting, when, uh, sorry, a simultaneous setting where everybody does, where we look at different, we compare sequential versus simultaneous. And uh, that's the point there. But no, what not really. So, what no. is sequential? What, what, what I did was sequential. When I do roll first, report first, and you do it second. It could also be simultaneous. We could do it at the same time. And there's some kind of coordination issue because we, in the first one, there is no coordination issue because you see my report. So if you, you want to lie, you lie. Predict. Predict the expectations. Based. Yeah. But it turns out that this, we did it with three players, but otherwise the structure is the same and the, the coordination problem is not there. That's what you run now? or you? Yeah, it's one of, I, I skipped a, a bit in the middle. Yeah, it's in do, progress. Do you have results on that? Yeah. The gist of the results as you compare, but I think I can show you. <coughs> So we had in this other treatment, other paper, the difference is just that there are three players and also and everything is the same. For, to, in order to earn money, they need to all report the same. So just to, if, if we did it with regular dyes, the probability of reporting the same number of times is very low. So we used special dyes with only three possible uh, numbers on them. You can buy them on eBay, only one, two, and three. Otherwise, and then we had three treatments. One is when we call it the steep treatment one. It's, uh, that's the one similar to what before. First A, then B, then C. Everybody sees the previous reports. Okay, and then there's a treatment where, and the payoffs are what you expect. Then there's one case where A rolls first and then the other two together, kind of an in-between treatment, and there was one where all of them just rolled together. We call it flat. We also think of it as simultaneous. So those are the three treatments. In this flat, there, potentially there's this coordination problem, right? Because you don't know there's the biggest coordination problem. But it turns out first that just look at the percent of triples now, right? Not, not double. It's very high. It's 80%, a little bit similar to the number that we had before. Before it was 82, so now it's 81, 79, 87. Those are not different from each other, but they're obviously very high. But then when you look at what's the proportion of double threes, which here is that the highest, it's uh, the equivalent of a double six before. It's not a double three, it's a triple three. And it's, so out of the 81%, 80% are are threes, or the worst. And out of the 79, 86% are threes. But in the flat treatment, out of 87, all of them are threes, right? Because so the coordination here is so, so easy. So this actually pushes them to, to the extreme. And in particular, this has to be an effect on the A players, on, kind of on the, like the A players in the other condition, at least sometimes, don't, don't behave so brazenly. When they have some kind of leadership or responsibility, and I won't, won't commit to an interpretation. But it's again repeating drive in all of it's very similar to this in structure to like 20 tries. I think 30 in this case, but, uh, but the same. So the, like the gist from this is that coordination is not, it turns out that it's not an issue at all. Mm -hmm. It's an easy coordination problem, mm -hmm. the focal point. And why do you call it steep and flat? What is the idea? I don't know. Sometimes in the old B literature you think of it, not in this, they don't apply it in this way, but it's like steep when there's one person, there's a hierarchy, me, then you, then him. Flat is when we're all the same, we just do it at the same time. Right? But it's kind of tentative uh, wordings. Uh, yeah, okay, so I heard about this too, but I don't remember why I showed this, because of your question, but what was the question? I don't remember. I don't remember, but this is a fascinating yeah. question. Okay. I think so the question okay. was, what were the results? Yes, that was the question. Of this, okay, but why did, it? never mind. There was some reason for this, okay, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you can go back to the previous study, so the one with the victim identity? Or? Yeah, yeah. So basically you failed to reproduce the Greenberg 2002, right? Because you find no significant main effect for the experiment of versus... Greenberg. Yeah, so they found the main effect for... There were also some qualifications there because some... There was some ethicality me measurement and there were also some... Some kind of organizational framework that... that code that deals with, uh, with ethics that was either in place or not in place for those particular people and it interacted with the result. But the gist of that is that when the money came out of an individual person, nobody lied. doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. You just don't lie. And when as the company... The as, as Fritz here. Yeah. So in that, in that paper, in the Fritz condition, or something like... Because it's, not, it's not a peer. And they're, it's uh, still a manager. But anyway, when it, and, and what's, what's similar to Fritz? Nobody liked. And when it was Max, it was qualified by some other 
like ethical uh, um, policies that, that, that they had in, in, in place or not. But if they had some, some kind of program in, in place, they, they, they didn't line that setting either. But if they didn't, they did line. So, but do you, do you think there is a concern that here, just to uh, echo the previous discussion about the dilution of experimental subjects, basically people didn't really believe that there is a crit and therefore uh, they were, were there, so I can't go into people's mind, but the truth is that they were there and the lab was mixed. We told people there are two types of people here. One are the people who are making decisions, the other people are passive and they are just affected by the decisions of the first. And still, so in principle, they can still entertain the thought that we're, that this is all a big lie, that actually everybody's making decisions because they don't really know because then they're paid one by one. But the reputation of the lab is to, to be truthful, so I, I doubt that it's, it's, uh, that it's the majority of the case, of the, that it would be a prevalent like a attitude. So I, I can't deny it completely. Where did you run this lab? In Vienna, both of them, in Vienna and Germany. The first one, we had, then we had some replication that I didn't tell you about in uh, Nottingham, which replicated some key results. But other than that, everything. Okay, so you replicated the effects of the first, the first one? The first one, the corrupt collaboration one. Some key treatments, not all of it, but in another country. Yeah, we, we just uh, have some wine and some crackers outside, so if you want to stick around and talk, I'm personally too. Okay, thank you.